was a medical school where the first description of the human uterus was described by this man, Soranos, who came originally from Ephesus and produced the first book called uh, Gynecology. But the world had to wait for another 2,300 years f to be introduced to the fascinating world of assisted reproduction. Today, we have more than 6 million babies born to this technique and its allied techniques. And at the beginning, uh, it was a humble beginning. This was the first paper by, uh, by Edwards. Stepped and Edwards in Lancet in 1978. Uh, at that time, there was no ultrasound. They had to rely on measuring hormones in urine and what uh, they called the, uh, this, uh, this fine rise in urine LH to decide the time of collecting the egg. There was no um, uh, ultrasound to collect the egg. The egg was collected by laparoscopy, and even laparoscopy, there's no, there was no cold light, there was no automatic insufflator, there was not even the CCD camera. So here is Jean uh, 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 looking besides Mr. Stepto here and trying to collect the uh, oocyte, which was a single oocyte, of course. Because they said, Stepto and Edwards at that time, that you can only do this in natural cycles. If you do Clomid, it doesn't work. If you give HMG, it doesn't work. But the Australians did not buy it, and they carried their first ultrasound series using clomiphenicitrate, and they had their first success in 1980, which was incidentally was the fourth baby in the world. So by 1980, there were only four babies born. And the Americans also did not buy it, and they used HMG and produced their first baby in 1980. 81. Even when we started at King's College Hospital in 1981, with these three musketeers working under the supervision of this great man, Professor Stuart Campbell, we were using HMG and clomiphenicitrate and our embryologist Phil Matson, who is of course now in Australia. And much water went under uh, the bridge, as they say, and this is the timeline of assisted reproduction. So stopping now and looking at the future, I was asked to have a look at the future and st start to maybe profess of what the future may be from the clinical point of view. What are the clinical opportunities, in my humble opinion, could be. And I um, have compiled 20 of these, prof uh, <coughs> of these uh, uh, profess uh, proficiencies uh, and uh, I would like to share them with you. The first one is genetic screening uh, may lead <clears throat> to better pregnancy rates, or will it? We heard Professor Brody now. As we know, it started, as he just said, we started with uh, um, uh, PG, uh, with um, um, fish uh, technology on an eight. Uh, cell embryo, and this is the seminal paper of Professor uh, Mastenbroek showing that, of course, it doesn't actually work and the live birth rate is in fact diminished. So people said maybe we should go for trophic to derm biopsy and also do a, a more advanced method of uh, diagnosing. And we know after that that this paper came, came from Elias Tahtuh and uh, Garcia Velasco showing that implantation rate will improve, but not, as Professor Brody said, the live birth rate. And of course, we have the problem of mosaicism, which was beautifully presented, who said that each of these cells in the trophectoderm is representative of its neighbor. And who said that the cells of the trophectoderm are representative of the inner cell wall? They don't, of course, and this important paper that Professor Brody has showed by Greco, who replaced 18 replace mosaic embryos in 18 patients and of course ending up by six perfectly healthy babies and two other pregnancies which did not continue, which pushed people like Norbert Gleischer to produce this paper saying that how PGS, PGS or PGTA laboratories have succeeded in losing all credibility.